Um, hello, everyone, and um, welcome back. Um, today's talk is the first one in this season, and today we are honored to have Dr. Tucker with us. Um, he will be talking about some very interesting about dinosaur. So, um, and I will give the ball to Jason, uh, who is the host, and invite uh, Dr. Tucker here. Right. Hello, everyone. So, our great honor to be invited, uh, Dr. Tucker, to come here to give a seminar today. Uh, we all apologize for the miscommunication last year. <laughs> so, um, Dr. Jim with uh, Stanley Schneider convinced NOAA to restrict the first band of the AVHR instrument to the longer wavelength portion of the visible spectrum, enabling the first global time series of photosynthetic capacity starting in 1981 from NOAA 7. He was among the first researchers to use this data and later uh, MODIS, WIRS, and the lenses to research the global land photosynthesis, land cover, drought, uh, famine early warning, ecological carbon disease uh, outbreaks, and uh, forest condition, etc. He has been awarded uh, NASA's Exceptional Scientific Achievement Medal, the Henry Shell uh, Medal from the Missouri uh, Botanical Garden, the National Air and Space Museum Trophy for Current Achievement, the William uh, Norbert a memorial Award from Earth Science, the William Picora Award from USGS, and the Galatia Medal from a Royal Danish Geographical Society. He's a fellow of AGU, the fellow of American Association for the Advancement of Science, and a adjunct professor with the University of Maryland. His published paper has been cited more than 66,000 times. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, the first point I want to make is that we have a very dynamic planet. It's the only planet we know in the universe which has life and which has sustained life uh, over, over hundreds of millions, if not a few billion years. This is a visualization of actual satellite data looking at the chlorophyll density in the oceans and the normalized difference vegetation index on land upon which we are superimposing the snow cover and ice cover from, from MODIS. So the oceanic and the land data as they relate to chlorophyll density or photosynthetic capacity on land are from CWIFs, and then the, the white colors are from MODIS. And it just shows you we have a very dynamic planet. And then I'll go to my presentation uh, right here. So, so, a few years ago, some dinosaur tracks were found at the Goddard Space Flight Center. I got involved in it more or less as the graduate student. Uh, I've never had a course in paleontology, even though I've studied a lot of paleontology since. This got me interested in the Cretaceous period, dinosaurs, climate, as they relate to the present time period. We've just seen how dynamic the Earth is. Uh, it's remarkable. And of course, because we're studying the land or the ocean surface, we try and minimize the influence of clouds. If you are someone who studies clouds, uh, I'm sorry, but there, we have a lot of data of clouds too. Now, there are more, there are between one and two trillion galaxies that are known from the Hubble Space Telescope. These are the estimates of the number of galaxies. And each, and each galaxy has on the order of a few billion stars. So far, we only know of one planet which has life, and that's our planet. So you would think this would make people conservative in how they treat the planet, not do silly things like use coal or burn a lot of fossil fuels or do things like that. And these are some of the people. So we're all in this together. Uh, Pierce Sellers, our late director of Earth Science at Goddard, former astronaut and excellent Earth scientist, would always say, we're all in this together. We need to find solutions to our problems and we can do it. 
And also our planet has an amazing biological diversity, these charismatic giraffes. And then from the age of dinosaurs, which ended about 65 million years ago, but lasted for over 100 million years, we had a tremendous array of different reptiles. All this is really remarkable and makes Earth's natural history uh, even more compelling to protect. So in my talk today, I'll be talking about dinosaurs, plate tectonics, Milankovitch cycles, satellites, and climate. These are some of the people who feature prominently in it. So this is Albert Wegner, who, uh, who first proposed about continental drift. He was ridiculed by many people, but he was right. He prevailed. Um, this is Professor Milankovitch. This is Admiral Hess, who was a physical oceanography professor, uh, I think at Dartmouth uh, or Yale. And then he was drafted in the Second World War and he was on a ship which had a sonar device. And wherever it went in the Pacific, he had the sonar device on and he was able to confirm plate tectonics because he said, as long as we're out here, we might as well be collecting data. Um, then we have Dave Keeling, who started the atmospheric CO2 concentration record at Mauna Loa as a postdoctoral fellow. And then we have some of the Earth, some of the first Earth viewing satellites. Now, whenever I give talks on climate, I stress we use geophysical variables. There's no, there's no belief at all. So I'll be showing some data which involve radar. You know, with radar, the radar cross section is really important, and radar is extremely well understood. I don't believe there's anyone who disputes what radar does and the accuracy with which it works. If that's the case, I think you're either ignorant, stupid, or dishonest. Um, and then I'll also be showing some data which pertain to gravity measurements from the gravity recovery and climate experiment satellite. Isaac Newton's gravitational formula, well understood, and uh, there's no ambiguity about that. Then I'll be talking about temperature measurements. And so here we have representation of the Planck function uh, and also showing how we can retrieve temperatures with Wien's law. And then these are manifested in various devices like thermometers, like you see here, which are based upon radiation measurements. Now, in 2012, this gentleman who lives nearby uh, dropped his wife off after lunch one day and was driving out of a parking lot. He looked up on the side of the hill and he saw the edge of this rock. He walked up to it. It's Ray Stanford. He is the mid-Atlantic self-taught dinosaur track expert. Never been to university, but he's, he's, he's an excellent natural history fanatic who reads and studies. He walked up and he found this track, which is exactly like it looked. It's from an adult notisar. So I received a phone call from our physical plant people saying, a $35 million building is about to go up and some nutcase has just found a dinosaur track. The person literally said, get your ass over here and survey this with ground penetrating radar because I've done a lot of ground penetrating radar and magnetometry work this weekend so we can move it. We don't want to lose 35 million. Well, I didn't care about the 35 million, but I thought this is pretty cool. So um, I got involved, and when we surveyed the area, we determined it was about three meters by one meter. This is on display now in the Earth Science Building. We tell our friends in astrophysics, we have something you don't have. We can go back in time to about 100 million years ago. So here's the discovery track. Turns out there's a baby notice our track inside it, so it was a parent and child. Here is a sauropod track, and then we have a wide collection of mammal tracks and other dinosaur tracks, including several pterosaur tracks. We call this uh, the Cretaceous uh, Rosetta Stone, which isn't really true, but that's what we call it. Okay, so why NASA? So NASA uses space for exploration and scientific discovery, looking up, looking down, and looking forward. So I'll be talking about looking down. Let's, look, let's go back to the Cretaceous period and see what, what the Earth was like about 110 million years ago when those dinosaur tracks I just showed you were found. Well, this is where all the continents were. They were just breaking up um, and starting to drift about. 
the atmospheric CO2 concentration was somewhere about 1,000 parts per million. Sea level was about 100 meters higher, and the average temperature was 80 degrees Fahrenheit, or about 10 degrees Celsius warmer than it is now. So right now, we're at 315 parts per million. We have glaciers, sea ice, ice sheets, present sea level, and the average temperature is about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, we used to think that plate tectonics were very important in lowering the atmospheric CO2 concentration from the Cretaceous to the present. But recently, there have been a paper or two which sort of argue with this. So uh, um, I have, something happened, we're not sure what it is, but um, one, of the, one of the culprits for this, or one of the causes for this, was thought to be plate tectonics, continental drift, and the, up, and the collision of India with the Asian plate, and then weathering, which resulted in scrubbing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere um, by um, weathering and burying it in the oceans. Whether that's true or not, something happened. We're not sure what it is. So, here we are right here when India first collides with the Asian plate. And then this is the global temperature comes down like this. This is based on the, on the isotopes of, of, of oxygen, O18 and O16, um, a standard approach in physical chemistry because this relates to the preference for um, or the incorporation of water uh, in, into snow, um, and then also in the carbonates which are analyzed here. What we see then is the temperature decrease at a very, very slow rate, but over tens of millions of years to the present period. And when the atmospheric CO2 concentration reached about 450 parts per million from the 1,000 or so that it was 55 million years ago, that is when the Antarctic ice sheet started forming. Then when it got down to about 400 parts per million, then the Greenland ice sheet started. You can take those two approximations as points of concern as we go back the other way. Now, it's really interesting uh, to look at, at the plate tectonics. And so this is, is, what, is, is what Harry Hess was able to do on his Navy ship with the sonar. He probably never had a he never had a dull moment sailing places and going in to look at, at all of the sonar returns at the bottom. Because these are the scars of India as it was heading north to collide with the Asian plate. So this validates plate tectonics. Now anytime you try and go back in time where you can't measure something directly, you have to use proxies. With all proxies, there's uncertainty because you're measuring something which is not directly associated with what you're perhaps interested in, like the atmospheric CO2. So here, Berlin and Royer, in a paper published about almost 10 years ago, uh, analyzed uh, the density of stomata on, on, on fossil leaves, phytoplankton cores, paleosols, liverworts. They also had a boron method and boron calcium method. And these are how all the proxies look, and you see the uncertainty associated with them. So this makes it very difficult to go back with any certainty to reconstruct what happened because you have to use proxies. But, but nevertheless, this is the best effort at a reconstruction from this time about 55 million years ago through the present. Now, at the same time, uh, or around 1900, 1910, <laughs> Professor Milankovic, who was a Serbian mathematician, started analyzing the effect of the three orbital components of the Earth, which are eccentricity, obliquity, and precession of the equinoxes, to see if they coincided, and this might be a cause for throwing the Earth into ice ages and bringing it out. Uh, he did all this longhand. Uh, it took him many years to do, but he did an excellent job, and that's why these cycles of glacial periods and interglacials are called the Milankovitch cycles. This should be an inspiration to us all. Should we ever have to do something like this, we could, but all of us code now, and so it makes it a lot easier. Now, 
Associated with this are the analysis of ice cores. And ice cores are really two mile time machines. I bought a book of Richard Alley's using my NASA credit card called the Two Mile Time Machine. And the people came over to my office from the, who, who, who review these and they said, we're going to have to report you. You shouldn't be buying science fiction books with project money. And I thought, well, this is really funny. So I confessed. I said, well, I'm really sorry. I won't do it again. So then it propagated up the line. And finally, someone said, no, this is not a science fiction book. This is an ice core book. But anyway, so what the ice cores are really are, are two mile time machines. You can analyze the core. And you do so. When you do this, you can use to get the temperature, the 018, 016, isotopic ratios. And then you can go in after you date the core and have all the dates. This is a perfect job for very hardworking graduate students or postdocs. Then you can go in and then you can extract from the bubbles in the ice remnants of the atmosphere at the time the core was formed. And from that, you can get the methane concentration the carbon dioxide concentration. This is from the Vostok core, which goes back about 440,000 years. So from this, you get these temperatures and what they are. So here we are right now up here. This was the last interglacial. And then it was this long descent of about 100 million years or so into the glacial maximum, our maxima, which is here. So we see one, two, three, four cycles here. And what's remarkable is how the carbon dioxide concentration and the methane concentration co-vary with temperature. Now, this is where a brilliant analytical technique of a former colleague of mine, Norden Huang, came in. He is responsible for what is called the Norden Huang nonlinear, non-stationary time series technique. It's an adaptive technique where you come into a time series and you decompose it. The very same technique is used to improve the clarity of cellular telephone calls. And I couldn't find my recording, which goes something like this. This is Norton Wong speaking with a lot of static. And then you run the Norton Wong technique on it, and it comes out, this is Norton Wong speaking. Because you get rid of all the high frequency variation. You decompose the signal into different periodicities. And you get rid of all the high frequency variations, which are static. And then it's um, uh, very, very clear. Now, I'll show how Norton Wong and Zafwa Wu, both of whom I've worked with uh, in regard as friends, um, in this paper, which they published in 2008, I think this is the best example of elucidating the Milankovitch cycles and the three components of it. Uh, and then the high frequency variations, which are not associated with climate. So this is an adaptive technique. And you come in, and there's no manipulation of it. And, 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 and from their paper, this is the ninth component, which was broken out, about a 22,000 year periodicity. Then the 10th component, about a 40,000 year periodicity. And the 11th component, about a 100,000 year periodicity. Now it also broke out this 400 thousand year periodicity, but the core is only 440,000 years old, so you have to disregard that. You do this on the Epica core, which goes back 800,000 years, then you bring out so this periodicity. OK, so then what do you do? So you go back to the original data you were using, and then you superimpose the results for 100,000 years on here. So we were the, of the raw data, and then this is what is predicted with only the 100,000 year periodicity. Now let's add obliquity. And so the Earth's orbit around the sun is slightly non-circular or eccentric, has a slight eccentricity to it. Um, the actual orbit has an eccentricity of 1.05, which is very slight. This means that uh, at, at one point in the cycle, the Earth is further away from the sun. And then it is closer to the sun with this periodicity of 100,000 years. Now let's add obliquity. So the Earth tilts. And the Earth um, the tilt varies with a periodicity of 40,000 years between 21 and a half and 24 and a half degrees. So something crashed into the Earth and knocked it off its axis, off its north-south pole axis. 
that's why it tilts. And so if we add in, if we combine the 40,000 year periodicity to the 100,000 year periodicity, we do better, right? So there's the previous one. Here's this one. Now if we add in precession of the equinoxes, we do really, really well. So these are the three orbital components. And what Zahua Wu and Norton Wong have done is they've shown that these explain in, a, in an adaptive way that Professor Milankovitch was correct. Now let's add in all the high frequency variations. They're all here. These are all periodicities less than 10,000 years. To me, this is weather as opposed to climate. It's a really cool example of an adaptive technique, which is widely used in many areas of atmospheric science, in cardiology. Anytime you have a, a well-behaved time series or some well-measured time series, you should certainly consider using the Norbert or, or, the, or the Hilbert Wong. Okay, let's go to the satellite record of climate now. And I want to stress geophysical observations, not beliefs. Now, I use this slide, which uh, I use to attack people who don't believe in climate change. It says at Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December, there was a radar station operating by this fellow right here. And, and uh, he was a private in the Army. And they were looking north like this. And, and they recorded and they observed the onset of all of these Japanese planes that were attacking Pearl Harbor on the morning of December the 7th. They called this idiot who was in charge of Hickam Air Force Base and said, look, we want to tell you there's a huge number of planes, a huge radar cross section headed your way. You better do something. He said, no. He said, I don't believe you. He said, uh, you're probably wrong. I don't understand radar. Uh, it's probably those six B-17s flying in from the mainland. There were six B-17 planes flying in, but the radar cross-section was a thousand times too large for that. So what happened? Bang. This is a good example. You, you ignore geophysical variables at your own risk. Radar is certainly one of them. Now we know from Confucius that we need proper definitions or else we can't have logical discourse. And without logical discourse, nothing can be accomplished. So all this fake news stuff, I'm a firm believer in physics and geophysics as the basis for proceeding. Uh, and uh, I think people who argue with, with geophysical variables like radar or gravity or temperature, I'm very disappointed in them. We know the Earth is warming because we, we can measure with radar what the sea level is. I'll show data of that. Know by looking at the sun what the total solar irradiance is at least over the past um, um, back to 1978. We can measure ocean temperatures, and we can do that with depth, not with satellites, but with um, autonomous buoys that dive. We have surface thermometers. We also have atmospheric soundings. We know the temperatures there are increasing. Last but not least, we know that glaciers and the Arctic sea ice uh, is behaving in a way consistent with global warming. And we're also losing mass from the ice sheets of Greenland as well as Antarctica. Now, people that don't believe in radar, I, I kind of think they probably get a lot of speeding tickets if they're, if they're like me. Um, as we know, radar is very, very accurate. And uh, it's useful for many things. So we have a series of, of different measurements Radar altimeters on satellites that record sea level. This is what the data looked like through November of, um, of last year, just two months ago. Um, this is how the data look. And, and what you see is the manifestation of more ocean mass or surface in the southern hemisphere. And it warms up in the southern hemisphere summer. And so you see this variation season, you see this increase on the order of about three and a half millimeters per year. Um, it, and, and of this increase in the sea level, it's due to two components. First is the thermal expansion of water warming. And the second is the actual melt, uh, principally of the ice sheets in, in Greenland as well as Antarctica. Now, 
I'll show how this can be checked with gravity data, from gravity satellites. And then I'll show how we're able to get a good measure of thermal expansion with these autonomous groups. So as of yesterday, there were 3,962 of these autonomous floats that record temperature and salinity with depth operating. And here's where they all were the last time they were on the surface. So we have pretty good sampling. This is a program called Argo, named after Jason and the Argonauts. The Argonauts, after the Trojan War, sort of caroused around the Mediterranean, getting into trouble and plundering and whatever sailors do. Uh, here's one of the floats. Uh, this graduate student or postdoc is about to launch it. It's, it's dropped off. They, then dis they spend about six or 12 hours at the surface. Then they descend to uh, about 1,000 meter depth where they drift for nine days. And they are continually recording temperature and salinity every hour. They store that. And then after nine days, they descend to 2,000 meters very slowly, doing the same thing. They drift there for a day or two, and then they slowly ascend, making these same measurements every hour. They then come to the surface, and they have a burst transmission to a geostationary satellite. And those data come down into California, where the Argo Center is. This is how we get temperature data with depth in the oceans. It's a huge collaboration among many countries. And again, as of yesterday, there were about 3,900 of these floats that were operating. In terms of surface temperature, there are, are several groups which have studied surface temperature. There is Jim Hansen's group from the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. There's also a group in NOAA, the National Climatic Data Center in Asheville, North Carolina. And then the Koch brothers, who are climate change deniers, funded a group at the University of California, Berkeley, called the Berkeley Earth Surface Temperature uh, Study, or BEST. And, and so they analyzed the data and tried all sorts of different things. And they ended up getting exactly the same result. So in one of their papers, we say they concluded that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. But hell, we already knew that. So the point is, there is no confusion now among all these groups on surface temperature trends. Whereas several years ago, there were many people who said, oh, it's a bunch of nonsense. This is highly selective. You're biasing this way or that way. Now, with a variety of different approaches, different interpolation schemes, uh, one gets, by these different techniques, same method, same answer. Now, let's look at total solar irradiance. This is what the raw data look like. So these are instruments on satellites looking at the sun, measuring the total solar output. So these started in about maybe 1978. Here, here's the first data from the Earth Radiation Budget. Here's ACRAM. Here are some total solar radiance instruments on NOAA 9 and NOAA 10, so on and so forth. And you notice they all have the same character, but they're slightly different. For example, all of these should be lined up. All of these should be lined up. If you look at the units, these are only off by a few watts per square meter. This is where calibration gets to be really important, along with the characterization of instruments. So what's happened is a group of, 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 of heliophysics people who, who study total solar radius got together. And they ended up putting all these data Together, they use these data right here, total irradiance monitor um, as the basis for this. And then they've now been extended and actually extended beyond 2010 to 2019. But what you see is the sun is remarkably constant. And in the entire satellite record, total solar irradiance only varies by one part in 500 which is a minuscule amount. So we can't blame the sun for global warming. 
sun is blameless. Here the data extended through uh, start of 2018, and I need to update this through 2019. Now, in talks, it's always good to have a poem. And so this is a poem about ice. Ice asks no questions, presents no arguments. Reads no newspapers, listens to no debates. Is not burdened by, by ideology and carries no political baggage as it changes from liquid, solid to liquid, it just melts. That's by a geophysicist at the University of, of Michigan, now retired, his name is Henry Paul. So let's look at some of the features of ice and let's look at some geophysical variables associated with them. There is a very remarkable satellite project called the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, or GRACE, where you have two paired satellites with a very accurate microwave or radar ranging determination between them. They orbit the Earth in the, uh, in the same orbit with about a 220 kilometer separation. And the radar device is able to tell their, their separation distance by one one hundredth of a millimeter. These orbit the Earth, and what they record is the variation in mass, which would, if say you're going over Greenland and it's winter and it's accumulated a lot of mass, well then the first satellite will speed up as it comes over, and the distance between the two satellites will lengthen, and then as the second satellite comes along, it will also speed up. It's a way of backing out mass using Newton's gravitational formula. These are just schematics of things, blah, blah, blah. This is what some of the data look like. So the cool thing about the GRACE data is you're measuring mass directly, and you can see where it's being lost. And because their separation is about 220 kilometers, these data, these data are gridded at a grid cell size of about 200 kilometers. That's one of the features you can't go to smaller areas because you just don't have the data because of the, of the basic separation of the cell. Here we come along Greenland like this, and we see that what happens in Greenland is you gain mass in the winter, you lose mass in the summer, but there's this downward trajectory. And this is where mass is being lost. It's not being lost in the center of Greenland, where mass is accumulating, but it's being lost around the margin. You can do the same for Antarctica. When you look at Antarctica, what you notice is there's almost no mass change in East Antarctica. There's a very sizable mass change in this portion of West Antarctica. And this is of concern because a lot of West Antarctica is below sea level. So ocean intrusion and in warm ocean water, even though it's two, only two or three degrees centigrade warmer, accelerate the melting of the ice in West Antarctica. Now, you never hear the climate change deniers arguing about the gravity. Why is that? Well, you can't fire a ballistic missile from point A to point B if you don't know the gravity field. And anyone who thinks the gravity data are not important uh, is being dishonest. You need to know the gravity field or else you can't launch satellites and you can't launch ballistic missiles. We hope none are launched. Now, we have some other measurements to make, which use geophysical variables, and one is sea ice. Um, at a wavelength of about uh, 1.5 centimeters, spectral emissivity uh, of sea ice and seawater are radically different on the order of 0.4 to, to 0.8 to 0.9 in terms of their respective spectral emissivities. So this means you can use passive microwaves to, uh, to, to, to estimate the extent of sea ice. And so let's look in all the Januaries. These are all the Januaries since these measurements were first started. And you come along like this, this downward slope. So these are all the Januaries, so this is in winter. Now let's look in August, which is where you reach, usually in August or September, you reach the sea ice minimum in the Arctic. Here's how these data look. So for every month there is, um, over this time, entire record, there distinct negative trends in sea ice in the Arctic. Now, the climate change deniers say, well, 
uh, it's not clear because in the Antarctic, we don't see these trends. Well, of course not, because the ice around Antarctica, you, you have an ocean that surrounds the continent. Whereas in the Arctic, you have continents that surround an ocean. So you have feedback processes which work in the Arctic. In the Antarctic, you don't have that. The heat is dissipated into the Southern Ocean. Now, Dave Keeling started making measurements of atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations. He was a postdoctoral fellow near Roger Reville on top of the Mauna Loa volcano, about 14,000 feet in Hawaii. And Dave Keeling, who I published maybe three or four or five papers with, he's no longer with us, unfortunately. He was an excellent physical chemist. He went up and started making these measurements of atmospheric CO2 concentration on top of this volcano. He started making them, and this is how they vary. They started making the measurements, and then they decreased, and then they increased again. And he thought he had a problem in his measurement technique. He was such a compulsive person. He, he was the most compulsive person I've ever worked with, which means on papers he could be difficult. But he was an excellent physical chemist, and then as soon as the cycle started again, then he realized, I'm seeing photosynthesis on land in the northern hemisphere. So this is the iconic Keeling curve, which is one of the iconic series of measurements in earth science. It shows the breathing of plants or, or the photosynthetic activity of plants. The atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration reaches a local minima in probably May or April. And then the northern hemisphere warms up, all the plants start growing, they suck out carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and then it decreases to a minima, which occurs usually in probably September. And then the cycle starts over again. So you see this breathing, uh, and then superimposed upon this curve is our release of fossil fuels uh, uh, from coal, oil and gas, biomass burning. So that is the secular increase. So as of um, maybe two weeks ago, the atmospheric CO2 concentration in Mauna Loa was 500 or 415.8 parts per million. And one year ago, it was about two and a half parts per million lower. Okay, so we're actually headed back to the Cretaceous because we're moving back to a, a Cretaceous-like climate because we're burning so, so, so many fossil fuels. This is the rate at which we're going back, about 0 0.02 centigrade per year. And this is about five to 6,000 times what the cooling rate was over geological time from, from the Cretaceous 50, 55 million years ago to now. So what do we do? Well, at the moment, we're lucky that we're making a lot of progress in renewable energy. So right now, people have stopped, with the exception of Japan, I read in the paper today and a few other places, have stopped building coal-fired power plants. Anytime you have a fossil fuel which requires two phase changes, as coal does, it's not going to be very efficient, right? You have to heat it up, and you have to go from a phase change of a solid to a liquid to a gas. This is the gas that's combusted. Two, fa two, fa two phase changes takes energy. So the energy yield is going to be much lower because you have to use that to get to a gas which you combust, unlike natural gas. And right now, with solar and wind, we're doing very well. So it's very logical to have a mixture as a bridge fuel of solar, wind, and natural gas that can totally away from, from coal. Coal is, uh, is obsolete, and if it wasn't for certain political pressures to burn more coal, at least in this country and Australia and places like that, coal would, would be dying a death right now. Now people are starting to work on, on turning the tables um, for extracting carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, storing it. It's called carbon capture and sequestration. This is an area where a lot of work is being done and the people who have breakthroughs here will not only do well financially, but they'll help us save the planet. What can we do? We should have tariffs based on carbon emissions by countries. If people aren't efficient at producing what, what they want to import or countries aren't, they should pay a very high tariff. And 
and then here we see solar and we see wind with fossil uh, with the fossil fuel of carbon dioxide of natural gas as a bridge fuel. What have we done before? You hear some people say, "Oh, the government can never do anything." This is a bunch of nonsense. 1942, when the Second World War started in the United States, we conceived how to make the atomic bomb, and we made it, and we used it within three years. Here's a picture of uh, Professor Oppenheimer from Berkeley. He's with one or two army people. And the picture taken at Los Alamos. If we put our minds to work on technological solutions, we can achieve this. We also have the Apollo program. John Kennedy said uh, in September of 1962, we're going to go to the moon within the decade. Damn, if we didn't do it, actually get there um, with Apollo 11, on the 24th of July, 1969. So we can do these things. It just requires getting organized. It involves universities. It involves the government. It, 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 it involves concentrated effort. But we can do this, and we can do it for the benefit of humanity and all of the amazing biological diversity on the only planet we know that has life. I think it's worthwhile. And as Pierce Sellers, our former director of Earth Science, who passed on, unfortunately, three and a half years ago, said, Let's get busy. So thanks for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions? Bill. Thanks for a wonderful lecture. So um, you mentioned a number of mitigating processes in terms of uh, renewable energy and things like that. Um, what about just plant more trees? Is that a viable measure? I mean, there are well, programs to do that, I understand. So planting more trees become a uh, well, carbon thing? Yes. <laughs> uh, certainly planting more trees would help. Uh -huh. The trees take a while to grow. And at the moment right now, people don't understand the land carbon sink. So this is something I'm working on using a huge volume of, of 50 centimeter data, millions of satellite images, massive supercomputing, doing this in the arid and semi-arid area. If you talk about the land carbon sink, people say, well, it's, it's here. And everyone and the tropical forest, people say it must be going into the tropical forest. Certainly, this will help. It, it will not hurt. But we need to do this at industrial scales and do it sooner so we avoid further increases in temperature and more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So yes, it helps. And, uh, and in the meantime, we probably have to worry about unintended consequences, too. You change the albedo of the Earth by changing forests, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, they're all, I mean, you always have to be concerned about un unintended consequences. <laughs> yes, plant more trees. We're all for planting more trees. Thank you. Um, so the plots that you had about when you were showing the Milankovitch cycle, they were, looked like they were had a periodicity of on the order of a hundred thousands of years. Um, are there? And then you showed later the plot where over tens of millions of years, the from the creationist, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, I don't know the pronunciation, the, the cretinous uh, uh, age uh, until now the of the global temperature. I'm curious. Uh, are there Milankovitch cycles that are on larger time scales due to uh, natural phenomena? There are not. And I forgot to mention that the forcing of the Milankovitch cycles um, such that it's overridden by a carbon dioxide concentration more than 400 parts per million. Radiative forcing of, of say, 500 parts per million CO2 overrides the Milankovitch cycle. It's so warm you don't accumulate ice, higher northern latitudes on land because it's warmer and the ice melts. I forgot to mention that. So this is why this is why the Milankovitch cycles kick in only when you get when you get down to where you start to accumulate ice on land, and that occurs at about 450 parts per million for Antarctica and about 400 parts per million for Greenland. Until that time. Radiative forcing of, of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere overrides the Milankovitch forcing. 
Thank you. If that, this concludes and thanks the speaker again.